I'd like to talk about sort of what is, I'd say, a classic learning role, classic unsupervised learning role by Enrique Oja. Um, and we're talking about time frame in the paper of 1982. And this became a very important work um, for multiple, multiple different reasons. And what it effectively allows us to see is finding an unsupervised algorithm that effectively normalizes the unsupervised learning in such a way that I can then take a look at my inputs and a vector of inputs, and I have a vector of weights. And these weights will then converge to the dominant eigenvalue in X for the covariance matrix of X. And you think, hmm, that's actually a really useful computation. And then, you know, after, and usually what you're going to be looking at is the Y point right here. Now, we could have a neuron, some nonlinearities in between it. No problem assuming that this still becomes the point of which I adapt from. So this is the Y that I'm going to be feeding back. I have a neuron, have a Y1, and I'm good. All of this will work just fine. But we're going to basically look at this whole spot, which is going to be nice. I can use a lot of linear mathematics to handle it. But I'm not going to be having quite a linear differential equation here. I'm going to have something that looks like sort of weight shift. I'm going to have sort of a Hebbian rule, which is y times x, an x vector. So it's like what I'd expect is an outer product of, the, of that y point, and which means this y point, and the input vector x. And then I add another term. So it allows me to normalize this term, which is I'm using now a term y squared times the vector w. And this is an interesting term. And there's actually some very interesting things in um, Oja's original paper, where he will talk about this comes out of, out of a Taylor expansion to get this term of a full normalization. Fair enough. Very interesting to see how it comes out. But this is the formulation you start with. Now, one of the first things that's interesting is to go, well, it's a normalized Hebb rule. And, and, and we can kind of see this right off the bat by saying, well, let me take this entire vector structure and multiply it by the weight transpose on all of these points. What's interesting when I do that is I get weight transpose dw dt and all of these terms. What's interesting is the dw dt turns out to be a norm squared. Actually, there's a half term in there, but that all normalizes in the tau. Let's not worry about that. And then I get w, w, I get this additional terms of y, which came from 4, and the wt, because again, it's a scalar, I can swap those, and x. Well, that's also w, that's also y. So that's a y squared. I've got a y squared here, and I've got a, I've got a w transpose times w. Well, that's looks like the norm, norm squared, L2 norm squared of w. And you're like, huh. Interesting enough, I get this very interesting differential equation on the norm squared of w. In fact, it's a very much of a straightforward linear differential equation. You could argue with a variable coefficient on what, on what y is and averaging over that, and one could work through that math carefully. But what you realize is that this is globally stable. It's going to be globally stable to where the norm of w squared is 1, which also means the norm. L2 norm is 1. This is really cool. This immediately gives us one very important constraint and one sort of way of looking at this problem. And another piece of it is to say, well, let's start to plug in for y and see what I get. Well, if I take this first equation, I get everything there. I know that there's a few things I have in any adaptive algorithm, that I have a separation of time scales, that I have x as a fast time scale, and, and and the weight is a slow time scale. x has to be 0 mean as a result. I can then look through these integrals that give me this kind of solution. It then also turns out I get an xx transpose. If I integrate that over, I get q, which is a covariance matrix. And that covariance matrix turns out to be very, very important and very, very powerful here in terms of like looking at the matrix that I'm building with. Well, that matrix now gives me something very interesting. Because now I get a Q here, QW, and I get a scalar times W, which turns out to be W, QW. And that has some meaning in its own. But if I look at this closely for the steady state solution, this is an eigenvalue problem. That's really cool, right? 
And so now that means that this scalar has to be one of the eigenvalues for Q. This mean, loud means, let me look at this from an eigenvalue direction. Take Q, again, it's going to be um, symmetric. So one can take as, as you have um, an eigenvector matrix, so where you have a, where E has a whole bunch of rows of the ordered eigenvalues, or eigenvectors, lamb, corresponding to lambda, which is a sorted set of eigenvalues. Because it's symmetric, we know that Q is greater than or equal to zero. We know all the values on that lambda give me a sense of the signal power. E is unitary, so it doesn't affect the signal power at all. So lambda has the entire sense of the signal powers. And then I'm going to project W onto that eigenvector basis and look at this vector A and see where does it go. Well, I plug everything in and I put the E in here. I notice I've got E transpose, which goes to identity because they're basically inverse of each other. Those cancel, those cancel, those cancel. You're like, let's rewrite this. I get tau E, I get an E, and another E. This is a scalar in front, so I can then pre-multiply by E transpose and all the E's disappear. And so now this just gives me tau times d a d t, which is this vector. I get an A and the eigenvalue, which is a diag diagonal matrix of all the signal powers. There's another A here, and then I get this structure. And it's really interesting because a couple things come out of this. This is still an eigenvalue solution. I know that A has to be equal to one, or this, this structure has to be equal to one of the eigenvalues of lambda. Well, of course, it's already a diagonal matrix, so that already forces a solution. It also forces that I have to have one eigenvalue, which also then forces A has to be one in a bunch of zeros. One can get very deep on the math here, but basically the solution is has to be one in a bunch of zeros. And so then you ask, and it still turns out the magnitude of it has to be one, so therefore that satisfies it. And because that still carries over from before. And then it turns out that this is then going to be globally stable. So the only way that can happen is if it selects A1 to be 1 and all the others are 0. So it selects the largest of the eigenvalues. And one could get very, very specific on the proof and put all the material together, but this allows you to really get a beautiful derivation of something that gives you a normal, gives you a set of a normalized eigenvalue, eigenvector system, from a single neuron layer. And you can take this and extend this in all sorts of ways, but this gives us a lot of opportunity as we look through this.